Hidden, a true crime podcast. A forensic psychologist and a journalist explore the hidden motives behind unthinkable crimes while examining our deepest fears along the way. This is Lauren Mathias. And I'm Dr. John Mathias. We're having dinner late tonight. It's around midnight Pacific Coast time, which seems like an appropriate time to discuss a horror story of this magnitude. (laughs) Thanks for joining us again. It's been a couple weeks. We've been moving into our new home. We talked to you a couple weeks ago when we were sitting on Home Depot boxes. We're now sitting on a couch, luckily. Still a lot of boxes. That we can't identify. (laughs) We still haven't found our utensils. And we still don't have a washer and dryer, but that's coming Friday. Living in our house at the moment may not be a crime, but it's definitely a mystery. (laughs) And speaking of crime, let's talk preliminary hearing. I know a lot of people are ready to talk about Lori Vallow-Daybell. We are too, but we had a major preliminary hearing that we first need to discuss, and it's actually been requested by numerous people to please talk about bits of the preliminary hearing, including some recorded phone calls. And we want to dedicate this episode to a self-identified super fan, Felicia Jones. Thank you, Felicia, for being so supportive of our podcast. I think when we started this last month, I never envisioned the possibility of a super fan, for lack of a better term, but (laughs) um, I've really appreciated your comments and your support and your feedback and thank you. And so we would like to do a shout out to you for being so supportive and encouraging us to continue in spite of the fact that we've both been really busy and moving. And exhausted right now. exhausted. Thanks for pushing us. Here it is, we'll do our best. We certainly have some things to talk about. And for those waiting for Lori Vallow Daybell, we will get there, but we did need to cover this preliminary hearing first. But because we're talking about it, I do want to throw out a little bit of a teaser on Lori, and that pertains to Lori's father, Barry. My take on Lori, and we'll get into this in much more depth over the next several weeks, but my take on Lori is that if we want to understand Lori, we need to start with her father, Barry. And one of the little tidbits you need to know about Barry is that several years ago, in 2018, he was distributing flyers for his law practice, but the problem was he wasn't a lawyer. The Arizona State Bar intervened and they shut him down. They issued a cease and desist order and they told him to stop distributing flyers and to stop practicing law if that's what he's doing because he wasn't a lawyer. His response to them was that the Arizona State Bar was incompetent and barely qualified to practice law. If you step back and think about that for a moment, I think you can learn a lot about Barry Cox. Think about the irony of someone practicing law whose job is to, at the very least, to interpret law, in many cases to uphold law, who's essentially saying he's above the law. Does that mean that he has some antisocial traits? Perhaps. We'll discuss that later. Does that mean that he might be somewhat narcissistic? Perhaps. We'll discuss that later. The question for me that I want to look at closely is how does Barry Cox influence the family system, the family dynamic that Lori grows up in? And I think the answer to that is profoundly. If you want to understand Lori, I think you need to begin with her father. And just another little tidbit, I'll throw out a connection that we'll be making down the road in some of the podcasts on Lori would be to think about Chad for a moment. I've talked a lot about Chad occupying the role of a deity and thinking he's a deity. When you think about a deity, typically you think about someone who sets the laws, someone who is also above the law. So now I've thrown out a couple of ideas. One, Barry Cox, above the law, a lawyer practicing law without a license, and two, Chad Daybell, a deity, also above the law. We'll get into this in much more depth, I promise. I know I'm making a very weak connection now because I'm not tying those pieces together, but we will tie them together down the road. I want you guys just to maybe chew on that connection for a little bit until we return to it in a future podcast. Now back to what happened last week, Chad Daybell's preliminary hearing. 
It was a two-day hearing, and Chad's case will now advance to district court. The judge determined that Deba likely committed two felony counts of conspiracy to commit destruction or concealment of evidence, meaning the bodies of J.J. and Tylee. Let's focus on a few elements of the preliminary hearing that were of interest to us. Number one, the overall level of dishonesty. It just amazes me. Two people who consider themselves to be translated beings, whatever that means. And religion. And religious and sanctimonious and moral just lie indiscriminately to everyone. To police. They talked about how they lied to police. And maybe they're thinking that the means justify the end, but these are people that have absolutely no problems lying. We knew from the probable cause that both Lori and Chad had lied to police when a welfare check, the initial welfare check was being done for JJ, and they lied to police about JJ's whereabouts. But to hear it in the body cam footage during the hearing was mind-blowing, just the depth of their lies. Who's he with in Arizona? He's with one of my friends in Arizona. Oh, you mind if he comes in? No, no, no. So, Sorry. who's the friend he's with? My friend Melanie. Her Melanie. son has autism. Her name is Melanie Gibbs. I gave him all the information on the phone. We're, we're a little what concerned because, well, the officers who were here earlier yeah. were checking and they got a bad vibe that, like something was going on here because a lot of stuff on? was going on. If you want to know, it's a lot of stuff. So, well, that's why we're concerned because very, it just was kind of weird. It is very weird. I've had to move around a lot. One of my brothers is trying to kill me, not the brother that lives here, obviously. He's kind of my protector. <laughs> my other brothers that was in with my husband who was trying to kill me for my two million dollar life insurance. So, no well, well, no. <laughs> so a lot of stuff has gone on in this last year. It's been a horrible year for us. I've had to move around. And so I was gonna move back to Arizona, put my son back in the school there because I tried to put him in school here, public school at Kennedy. Okay. He went for two months, we tried it, but he had such a hard time. So I don't tell people the truth about where we are and what we're doing because of those reasons. So I look like a suspect, but I am not a good person. I've raised all of my kids. I've done everything that I'm supposed to do in life, but everyone is causing me trouble right now. So we don't want to cause a lot of trouble. Does Lori even have a conscience? Like she's so she's lying so freely, so indiscriminately. It just flows from her mouth like butter. <laughs> I think it's a great question. I think it's a question we're going to answer down the road. I think the shorter answer is that Lori probably lacks more conscience than Chad does. Dun, dun, dun. For next time. That's a good teaser, too. And they also were dishonest about knowing each other. In the preliminary hearing, there's a body cam moment when Lori, she pretends not to know Chad when, in fact, they're married. Well, we had two detectives over here trying to... Looking for you oh. a little while ago. Oh, because I was at the store. And they ran into well, probably one of your brothers. In My the back brother here. and his friend, probably. Oh. Who's been that? moving. Chad. Chad from around here? Mm -hmm. What's his last name? Okay. okay. Chad, the, Chad the B A Y B E L O. Mm -hmm. He's an author. Doesn't he live like out in the... Isn't that the Chad the Bell that... I think his wife passed away recently. Presumably, if you're married to someone... You usually know them pretty well. Especially if you're going to ride on a chariot to the end of the world with them, right? You, you presume they know them. What was interesting to me about this fact was the lack of planning, the arrogance of these people. You would think that when the police showed up, they'd have some reasonably consistent story about what happened, and they don't. There's no planning at all. There's no strategy here. If Lauren and I were to commit... Some horrendous crime. If you crime, and I planned a murder. Right. If we planned a murder. If we we planned, would have a decent plan, I we think. We would probably be on the same page. I think so. About what happened, or at least we'd have some discussion. When you go to the, I don't know that person and have their number and you're married, it probably isn't going to look good. It would imply that they really thought they were just going to get away with this. Well, not only get away with it, I think they, it also shows to some large extent that they did believe that the world was coming to an end. That if the world's coming to an end, why bother with getting your story straight? Or that the Lord would protect them. I think that's part of their big theory, too, is that the Lord would protect them. Right, just like he was going to protect Chad when the bodies were being discovered on his property for him to lie to police 
Just the irony there. He'll lie straight to a police officer's face despite believing in this rigid black and white religious view of the world. But like Chad always does, he has an excuse, which I'm sure was, well, sometimes you have to lie for the Lord's sake. Right. He's going to testify. Starts everything with, I testify. I just want to testify. Right. He's going to testify that it was what he had to do for the Lord. Another interesting element of the preliminary hearing to me, and it's, it's, it's something a lot of you have asked questions about, is the Melanie Gibb call. When she called Chad and Lori and challenged them on the whereabouts of JJ. For people to understand this call, Again, the children at this time were still missing. Their bodies had not been found. Lori and Chad left the day after the welfare check. They went to Hawaii and did not tell anyone where they were going. They were married. The children were missing. And Melanie Gibb had been requested by Lori to lie to police and tell police that JJ was with her, which she did lie at first. And then she decided to record this phone call, I'm pretty sure, to save face. One of the interesting things about this call to me is it shows without question that Chad and Lori are both involved together. Very involved together. They're both in on this plan. And so it would be interesting to see if at some point one or the other of their defense strategies becomes to deny that they were in on it or maybe to scapegoat Alex Cox. Chad's denial of knowing Lori early on actually may be a bit of a precursor to that. At the end of the preliminary hearing, his lawyer was starting to hint at the fact that Alex Cox and Lori had a, quote, special, unquote, relationship. It implies that Chad's defense attorney may, at some point, start moving in the direction of separating Chad from Lori and Alex and try to pin the entire entire murderous scheme on them. Alex and Lori, brother and sister. Here's some of that call now. This is a recording on December 8th at 3.43 p.m. And I am calling Chad Daybell's phone number and hopefully I will be talking to both of them, Chad and Lori. So here goes the phone call. Hello, sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Lori. Hi. Hey, let me put on speaker. Oh, okay. All right. We're enough with the phone. <laughs> How are you guys? We're okay. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. I was wondering, where, where are you guys? We're just hanging out. Hanging out? <laughs> are, you, are you in Idaho? We're no. in Idaho. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind, Lori. Yeah, of um, course, honey. I wanted to know, um, you remember we talked about JJ going to Kay's house, and you told me they went there, and now he's not there? I was wondering what happened. Well, I had to move him somewhere else because of her actions, so... Was she, was she doing something? Like, was she trying to come get him or something? Or, like, trying to kidnap him? Well, she's, yeah, she said that lots of times before, but, um. Okay, I, well, when, you know, when I asked Chad the other day, I was like, hey, um, you know, where, where is JJ? And he said, for my security, he didn't want me to know. So is there a reason I should be in danger to know where he is? <laughs> No, it's nobody. It's his danger. It's the danger that there's people after me. Okay. We so just felt that if you knew, that puts you in a danger. <laughs> well, just in a bad position. Yeah, a bad position. Everybody, if they don't know anything, then they don't have to say they know. Right, so you're just worried. Okay. Um, I'm just to keep him protected. And, and keep you protected. And keep yeah. everybody else protected. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. This entire call is 20 minutes long, and we'll have the full call on our Facebook page, Hidden a True Crime Podcast, or at Hidden True Crime. But one thing that happened a lot during this conversation was argument over scripture. Take a listen. Did he hide? He had to hide. He had to hide because they were so, um, oh. they were so, um, everybody was killing everybody in the society. Everybody was dying. They were killing all the neighbors. 
felt in the scriptures had to hide in the cavity of a rock by day and go out by night. The, pro- the, the prophets, night. the prophets did. They did. Yes. Yet you should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary. He would have been with you in every trouble. So when we work with the Lord and are obedient, he has, he's going to protect us from adversarial darts and all kinds of negativity. But when we open the door to Satan, he comes in, and then he attacks, and then he takes away to make it look like somebody else took it away. But that's not how God works. He doesn't work in darkness. I agree with you 100%, and that's what the Lord is doing for me, exactly what he's doing for me. Oh, it just, it just, it just we sounds We have not weird. opened the door for darkness now. Darkness is knocking on the door all the time because that's the way dark works with the light. A lot of this call is sitting in Sunday school, sitting in church, and listening to people debate the truthfulness of various scriptures. I remember when I was in Sunday school, and I was 10 years old, that some of my peers would have these types of debates. How old were you again? 10-ish. Exactly. 10. It was a little bit like listening to children to me. Very juvenile in, in a lot of ways, but I guess that's this entire case. That goes back to some of the observations we've made about how literal the conversations are between them and how literal they interpret the world. We talked about this to a large degree in our third episode about Chad Daybell's closed-mindedness, and I think that theme gets repeated over and over. We see it in this call. We see references to the end of the world. We see talk about what scripture's right and whether Moroni did so-and-so and and whether... My favorite part was when Melanie uses a scripture against Lori about Korahor, and Korahor is the Antichrist in the Book of Mormon, and Lori gets so offended, and she says, are you kidding me right now? You're calling me (laughs) Korahor? Here's that part. Carnal and natural desires, that's what influenced him. And he was very, very deceiving. I natural desires. Well, honey, you got a lot of natural desires. We all know that. That's what you think is me, Cora Hart? Are you kidding me right now? I think both of you have hey, had you similar, right similarities. It's in the scriptures. It's in the scriptures. And the scriptures are very powerful. Yes, they are. I live by the scriptures, as you know. I know, but we can rest the scriptures for our own vain glory. I rested the scriptures? We can. We can do that, and I feel that you have to to see our our belief systems. Do I rest the scriptures? Is that what you're accusing me of at this point? I feel that you have. That's one of my favorite parts is they're, they're like 12 years old and calling each other names and getting offended when... Remember, there are two missing children, but not only missing, at this point, they have been murdered and buried in Chad's backyard while they're arguing over scripture meaning. Right, and there's there's a lot of gaslighting going on in this conversation. Right. Lori constantly challenges Melanie, Melanie's perceptions, and constantly tells her that she's turning on her. Here's one example of gaslighting when Melanie brings up a concern and Lori's response is, you know me, Mel, you know me. So I can tell that you're just adversarial, Mel. I love you. I'm sorry that you feel this way. Because I actually do care. I'm sharing what I feel. It doesn't feel right. I don't have peace about it. I never have felt 100% peace about it. I always felt like a little weird in my stomach about all these things. You know me, Mel. You know me. This does not sound like you. This sounds like you've been influenced by somebody dark who wants you to believe dark things and have fear and have fear of the celestial world. I don't have fear. You obviously do. No, I have a piece of conscience and I can see clearly. So in a lot of ways, I know I refer to conversations I remember having as a 10-year-old, but I also think it's as if these three had just watched a Marvel movie like Iron Man, and now they think it's the truth. And they're debating the reality of, of the suit, and they're debating the mechanics of the suit, and they're debating whether Tony Stark can transform the world, and they're debating fiction, essentially. They're creating this fiction, and then they're living in it, and they're debating it. They don't know 
better to step outside of this framework and to evaluate it from a rational perspective. What would be a rational way to look at that? To have some element of self-reflection, to have some element of saying, hey, what if, what if there's other perspectives here? What if the world isn't going to come to an end? What if Korahor is a metaphor? <laughs> that would never cross their minds. <laughs> exactly my point. And that's why they're in that predicament. Another interesting tidbit in that call was Melanie referencing Chad's opening dark portals. You would have been supported if you had not opened dark portals and dark junk. You would have been safe. I know we keep talking about the portals, but when Melanie said that, it actually led me to believe that Melanie was all in on the scheme, that Melanie was all in in this cult, because the way she mentioned the portal, it sounded as if she believed it. You would have been supported if you had not opened dark portals. When she did her interview with Nate Eaton, she stepped back from that a bit and thought that the portals were strange. But in that call in December, she's talking as if the portals are real. There's some element of involvement here with Melanie that's not being acknowledged. I think that Melanie's knowledge, perhaps, and her involvement in Chad's cult is probably more than we're aware of. I think she's minimized a lot of this, and I think she probably knows a great deal more than she's letting on. And that slip, that acknowledgement about opening dark portals suggests that she believes it, and that she only challenged that, refuted that when it became apparent the portal was absurd. Which only became apparent after two children were murdered. John knows I have my issues with Melanie Gibb. I am very, very grateful that Melanie Gibb has come forward I am very grateful that she recorded that call, and I'm grateful that she finally told the truth to police. But some people are calling her a hero because of her testimony during the preliminary hearing, and really, she could have done a lot more early on. What does it take for her to finally realize that children's lives are in danger? She knows what happens to zombies. She's believing this stuff. She's clearly very religious, as you just point out. She's scripture bashing with them rather than talking about two missing children she seems to care more about what's right and wrong than two children's lives and she did lie to police initially about jj's whereabouts right which challenges her credibility about everything also she's completely unemotional we're talking about murdered kids and we're talking about at least in december we're talking about a child that's missing and she's unemotional about it and she believed the kids were dead. In her interview with Nate Eaton, before the children's bodies were found, she said, I believe they're on the other side. They're dead. They've been murdered. So in other words, she is clearly thinking that something happened to these children at this point, and she seems more concerned about getting the scripture right than where JJ is. There's almost something disassociative about her response here, that she's more concerned about the intellectual meaning and interpretation of scriptures rather than the potential death of a child. For clarification, Tylee is not mentioned in this December phone call because Melanie was only asked to lie to police about JJ. The welfare check initially was just about JJ, sadly, because Tylee had been missing a lot longer. So Tylee wasn't even brought up in this phone call, which is another concern to me, because if JJ is missing, and she's concerned about JJ's welfare, and she hasn't seen Tylee in months, and she had visited them and Tylee wasn't there, I also wish that she had asked about Tylee and thought to ask about Tylee in this conversation. She had heard Lori call Tylee a zombie. Why is she expressing no concern for Tylee during this phone call? Is it because she only lied to police about JJ? So she's concerned more about her welfare than Tylee's? Or does she know something about Tylee that she's not letting on or doesn't want to get involved with? That upsets me too that she doesn't bring up Tylee. Right, and she's unemotional about it. Her concern for the welfare of the children is secondary to her concern for whether she's gotten scripture correct. The other element of the preliminary hearing that was very tragic and difficult to listen to but important to discuss nevertheless was the state of the children's bodies. Yes, so trigger warning for anyone that doesn't want to hear how the children's bodies were found and in what condition they were found. The difficulty I think for us, for this one, was the way these human remains were found. So it was kind of this, for lack of a better term, it was kind of a mass of dismembered human remains burnt, partially burnt, 
And so we did the best we could. It was kind of hard to recognize, like, what are we looking at here initially? You know, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. We know there's tissue here, there's organic matter here, and we just couldn't recognize what we were dealing with. But layer by layer, we tried to, we ended up just excavating all around this mass of human remains. And we ended up excavating all the way around it. And at the very bottom of this mass, we find, you know, this melted green bucket. And then to the bottom, the side of that green bucket, we eventually find a skull. And then to the side of that skull, we find a mandible with some teeth. That those are the significant things that you could finally see and recognize out of this mass. Okay. Profilers often talk about serial killers' signatures. In this case, I think it's fair to call Chad and Lori serial killers because we're talking about multiple murders here. So I think that's an apt description. When profilers look at a crime scene, sometimes called crime scene analysis or psychological profiling. They look at three things. They look at the MO or the modus operandi of the murder. They look at what's called the signature of the murder, and they look at victim characteristics. The MO is basically what led to the death of the victim. In other words, what was the method of killing, and was that sufficient to kill the person? The signature is what goes above and beyond the MO. In other words, the signature would be something that's unique to a particular crime scene or a particular murder that exceeds what's necessary to kill someone. If you were to strangle someone, there's a point at which that person might die, and that would be the MO, strangulation. However, if you continue to strangle that person, and then you broke their neck, and maybe you stabbed them, stabbed them or anything above and beyond what was necessary to kill that person would then be a signature and that's important because criminal profilers look at signatures in an attempt to discover who the killer might be they look at patterns and killings and those are called signatures in the case of chad daybell and Lori, the bodies and the way the bodies were found provides a lot of interesting information about them one of the things about signatures is that profilers attempt to make inferences about psychological needs or idiosyncrasies or in other words they're taking the way the bodies are treated and they're making assumptions about what would be necessary to do that to someone. What is the psychological element that would allow or need? What is the psychological need that would allow someone to kill at that level? This is also sometimes called overkill. That's where the term overkill comes from. A signature is going beyond the means that might be necessary to kill someone. A classic example of a signature might be you could stab someone one time to kill them, but in murders involving passion, for example, you'll find that people get stabbed a hundred times. That's overkill. Which shows rage. Oftentimes. Shows rage, right. It shows it shows rage, it shows impulsivity, it shows the inability to curtail behavior at a certain point. In these particular cases, if you look at three of the bodies, if you look at Tammy's body, if you look at Tylee's body, and you look at JJ's body, you see an interesting pattern, for me at least, which is that Tammy, in some ways... Tammy is Chad's first wife that was killed two weeks before he married Lori. Who supposedly died of natural causes, although Chad... When talking to Melanie, Chad mentions that his children were present. Right. Here's how Chad explained she died in that recorded phone call with Melanie Gibb. Although originally he said it was in her sleep, his story is changing. I just want to testify that I, I know Tammy was had the yeah. conspiracy theories. My sister-in-law's right behind it all, and I hope that you're not being influenced by that dark team. I don't know who she is. I'm sorry, you oh, said your sister-in-law? I don't even know her. Oh, I know, but she's coming up with the same type of theories. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. My own children were there. They testified that Tammy had been getting weaker and sick, and I begged her to go to the doctor. There's, she just, her heart was failing her. She was physically falling apart, but she hates doctors. And mm -hmm. She just passed away. Um, 
that's how it happened. My son Garth was right there with me the whole time. My kids were with, at the house within the 20 minutes of her passing. Like, there were two coroners. They checked her out right there on the bed. All these conspiracy theories just make me sick to my stomach. Uh, just absolutely sick. I know it's, I've been told for years that Tammy would pass away at a young age. Mm -hmm. and I had no idea that Lori would even be a part of my life. I just knew that I, my life had two segments. And that I know Tammy's on a special mission and she's with my kids. She's visited them. Just, there's so much, Melody, that you, you just have to have faith. And this is not some sort of master plan. There's no way Lori and I could ever come up with this. His story changed in terms of how Tammy died. But what's interesting to me is the fact that if we assume this is a murder, it appears that Chad killed her to avoid detection, probably through some type of poisoning or some type of chemical that he injected, although we don't know the autopsy report. But my point is that her body wasn't disfigured, that he did this in a way to avoid as much pain as possible for Tammy. There was, for lack of a better term, some concern about her well-being and the amount of pain that she might suffer. And if you look at the other two bodies, especially Tylee, which was horrendous, Tylee's body was decapitated. Dismembered her pelvis was separated from her body. Her spine was severed. Her spine was severed. Her jaw was separate from her head. She was burned. It's a horrible situation. And even if she was already dead at that point, it's still a horrendous signature. It's a signature that shows rage and dominance and vengeance. And it's in many ways the complete opposite of Tammy. And yet, probably the same person. And let me say this. We don't know at this point who killed Tylee. It could have been Alex Cox, who's now deceased, or it could have been Chad. But we do know that Alex and Chad were together on Chad's property burying Tylee and that Chad sent a text to Tammy afterwards saying that he'd been out all day burying a big raccoon that he shot. So we know that Chad was there doing what he did to the body, whether she was dead or alive. He did this. So if Chad wasn't disfiguring the body himself. He was involved with it. He knew what was going on. There was some speculation that he considered Alex Cox to be a soldier. In that case, Alex was simply carrying out his orders. So Chad would have had a direct say on how these bodies were treated. I guess you might be able to argue that they dismembered the body maybe in an attempt to dispose of it or to incinerate it at some level, but I don't think that's the case. As I talked about in episode four, I believe that Tylee challenged Chad. I believe that when Tylee found out that she was labeled a zombie and she saw the writing on the wall, she started to question Chad's belief system. I think she started to push back against the deity. And that put Lori in a real dilemma in terms of does she choose her child or does she choose Chad? Chad probably escalated his vindictiveness towards Tylee at that point. And no doubt that's one of the reasons Tylee received one of the highest dark ratings possible because he was trying to alienate her from Lori, I'm sure. So it's no surprise, although tragic as it is, it's no surprise to me to see that her body was completely disfigured. It's consistent with my interpretation of the evidence that Tylee probably challenged Chad to some degree. And that's a big no-no when you're a deity who's going to lead people into the New Jerusalem. JJ's body is a bit of an enigma. If we're trying to figure out a signature here, it's definitely more towards the violent side, that the body was wrapped in plastic, the head had a garbage bag around it, a tremendous amount of duct tape apparently was wrapped around the head and in his mouth. And when I first heard during the preliminary hearing the way JJ's body was found, my first thought was that perhaps he had been buried alive. I hope that's not true. I hope that's not true. But the way the body was found and the garbage bags, it's peculiar. He was wearing the same pajamas that he was last seen in, as well as socks. He could have been poisoned. He could have been strangled. It's hard to know. I don't think it was a kind death. I guess as kind as any death can be, I feel like this was a death that involved a certain amount of violence and aggression. While the body wasn't dismembered like Tylee, where there's clear signs of rage, the body was not pristine either. The bags around his head indicate potentially some 
some struggle. They were trying to silence him. The duct tape in his mouth might indicate that he was screaming, that he was pushing back, that they tried to silence him. Those two bodies show to some degree that this apparently docile, kind, humble prophet that Chad Dable is supposed to be is filled with anger and rage and vengefulness and that he'll stop at nothing to have his mission fulfilled. These two bodies show that his signature is actually one of aggression. And it's also interesting to note that, that his signature changes when it's someone that he feels close to, someone that he was married to for many years, he was more respectful. You might say that he did that because he wanted to avoid detection, but I don't, I don't think that's true. I think that part of his rage or part of his signature here is related to the fact that what he would consider blood versus non-blood required different responses. Although it is suspected that Tammy was possibly going to be shot. We don't know if that was Alex Cox with a gun. If, if in fact, that was the case, it did appear that someone tried to shoot Tammy a few weeks or was it a few days or a week before she was actually killed that's true then the poisoning would be a stopgap measure that would be consistent with his other signature of a violent murder so don't be fooled by this supposedly calm docile demeanor of chad daybell underneath that facade is definitely lurking a violent murderous person and the final piece I want to talk about from the preliminary hearing that really stood out to me did occur in the Melanie Gibb call. And that was Lori's statement that, that basically Melanie just needed to hang in there because the world was coming to an end and soon they would be with Jesus. Here's that part of the call. I don't know what else to say. Sam, Christ, when he comes again and he's coming soon and we will all stand there and you will know at that point that he has supported me and has supported me the whole time, and I have not been deceived. This is proof to me that this whole scheme was based upon Chad's belief system and his status as a prophet and his desire to lead the 144,000. Back in the 1980s, a criminologist by the name of Robert Holmes began to develop a typology of different serial killers. And Holmes essentially came up with four different types of serial killers. And I, I think this is interesting at this point to introduce this research. It'll provide some insight into this case. Holmes Holmes believed that the first type of serial killer was what he called a visionary serial killer. A classic visionary serial killer would be Charles Manson. Manson was driven by command hallucinations about killing people. He believed that voices were directing him to kill. A classic visionary serial killer is someone who's psychotic, essentially, or paranoid schizophrenic, like Manson, who has a vision from voices or God or other sources outside of oneself that directs them to kill. So that's the first class of serial killer. That's a visionary serial killer. The second kind of serial killer is what Holmes called the hedonistic serial killer. The hedonistic serial killer essentially kills for the thrill of it. Well, actually, Holmes amended that later. He said there were three reasons that hedonistic serial killers kill. One was the thrill, another was greed, and another was lust. In this category, two of the best-known hedonistic serial killers would be Jeffrey Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy, both of who killed from lust, essentially from their arousal, in the case of John Wayne Gacy, sexual arousal to children. John Wayne Gacy was not only a pedophile, but a pedophile with an extremely violent, homicidal personality who was unable to contain his sexual urges and derive pleasure from raping and murdering children. Gacy would fall into the class of hedonistic serial killers, the third type of serial killer that Holmes identified, and many of these categories, by the way, are still widely recognized and used today to understand the various types of serial killers. The third type of serial killer is what Holmes called the power and control oriented type. This type of serial killer essentially derives gratification from the complete control of the victim. When this type of serial killer exerts control over the life of the victim, the murderer experiences pleasure and excitement, not necessarily from the sexual part, as John Wayne Gacy did, but from the belief that he has the power to do 
whatever he wants to another human being who's then rendered completely helpless and within his total control. An example of a power and control type of serial killer would be Israel Keys. Keys was very much consumed by absolutely controlling his victims and watching them suffer. There was something very sadistic about Keys, and I think that fits into this category of the power and control serial killer. Typically, these are your classic psychopaths. These are killers that get a lot of pleasure out of sadistically harming their victims, controlling their victims, watching their victims suffer. This would be Israel Keys. The final type of serial killer that Holmes identified is now going to land us in the realm of Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. And that is the mission-oriented serial killer. The mission-oriented serial killer kills because they're trying to fulfill a mission. Oftentimes, that mission will be related to some type of purification, some type of desire to rid the world of a particular class of people. In this case, classic example of a mission-oriented serial killer would be Hitler. The Nazi regime was based upon racial purification. Hitler's goal was to rid the world of Jews who he perceived as being impure. If that rings a bell, it's because in our last podcast, we we talked about one of the books that Chad had written where he talked about going to a world of purity and cleanliness. Right. There's a similarity there, except that Chad's purification is based upon ridding the world of zombies, which again brings us back to his rating system. We can't seem to ever avoid that. In his rating system, Chad clearly has the ability to preside over life and death by judging people. The goal is to get rid of dark spirits, to retain good spirits, specifically the 144,000 that presumably will be chosen by him, and to create this world that's pure and clean and holy and untouched by human problems or human dilemmas. Hitler was able to orchestrate a significantly larger movement. Nazi Germany was on the cusp of collapse when Hitler took over. I think there was a lot of desperation in Germany at the time. The currency was being devalued. There were so many reasons why the nation was searching for a scapegoat. If Chad Dable wanted to muster a similar response, I doubt he's going to find it by appealing to people's desire to rid the world of zombies. I guess unless you think The Walking Dead is real. Melanie Gibb and Lori <laughs> seem to. <laughs> right. If you think if you take The Walking Dead to be factual, then perhaps you might, you know, jump in on Chad's cult. But if not, then you're probably going to resist joining a cult that thinks that portals are cool and zombies are the answer to cleaning up the world. When you think about Chad as a, a mission-oriented serial killer, there's a massive irony here, which is that Chad's trying to create this pure world and the afterlife, and he's doing it through the most impure means of purification possible, which is murder, right? What could be more impure than murder, than dead bodies, than dismembered bodies, right? It's a, it's a huge paradox. This is someone who lacked any insight or self-knowledge whatsoever to realize that the means to getting to that world, according to him, is probably the most immoral, impure type of behavior that any human being can engage in, and he had no problem doing it. Right. Thinking of himself as a, as a deity obviously helped, that he, as I said in the beginning of this podcast, that if you're a deity, you make the rules. Well, this is why he's also a terrorist. I'll be talking a lot about that analogy with terrorism when we talk about Lori in some future episodes, by the way. So stay tuned. We will get to Lori. So before we sign off, a few of our listeners have pointed out our podcast seems to have some value to them because it's not only about crime. The crime is a vehicle through which we can talk about the human condition, and even the positive side of people. We're trying to end with an aspiration that looks at crime, but then goes beyond crime and maybe helps us think about human beings in general. I want to do that again. When I was in grad school, I developed a friendship with another future psychologist at the University of Southern California. When he left grad school, he went into private practice for a number of years, and then he, be he became disgruntled with private practice, and he felt that life coaching was the way to go because he felt like he wasn't addressing enough of the positive facets of human beings, that 
clinicians typically, myself included, we spend a lot of time dealing with the dark side of people and with problems and pathology and you know, that gets hard. I talked to him about switching over to life coaching and I asked him, what's your focus gonna be? What is it you want to really help people with? And he told me that he believed working on people's missions was the most important thing, that he wanted people to develop really clear missions about their lives, much like a company. So I'm sure all of us at some point have had to sing the company song, whether we liked it or not. Getting back to mission-oriented organizations was a massive movement in like the late 90s, early 2000s. I think that's less true today. But at the time he was doing this, it was around that time. And when companies were all talking about getting mission-focused, developing missions, he thought that was a great idea. Why don't I just apply this to human beings? So everybody that came to see him, he would say, what's your mission? What's your goal? What's your purpose in life? And I think there's some value in that for sure. I think all of us need to have some sense of purpose, probably some type of mission if we can. I think that's helpful. But here's my critique. What if you become so wrapped up in your mission that there's no room for flexibility? What if that mission takes over your life, like Chad Debo? What if that mission consumes you? What if that mission involves murdering children at some point and you're so wrapped up in that mission you don't even see it? You don't even acknowledge it. What's the risk in that? I think my caveat to my friend, the life coach, I don't know if you're listening, maybe you are, would be you can have a mission, but I would highly recommend you keep that mission flexible. That's what I call resiliency. Resiliency is about having a mission and a purpose, but building some flexibility. Life changes quickly. Everything changes quickly. Nothing lasts forever. I think our missions should reflect the fact that our goals are gonna change, our life is gonna change in unexpected ways. If your mission is something that really resonates with you, I say stay with it, but also stay open to the fact that when it becomes clear that your new Jerusalem isn't gonna happen, you need to adapt, you need to change that mission. When I'm talking about this now, I'm also thinking about a famous Charles Dickens character, Ebenezer Scrooge. The reason I'm thinking about that is because Scrooge had a very clear mission in life, which was to make money and to run a successful business. He didn't really care about much else. For Scrooge, one of the great lessons he learned was that his employees mattered, and that specifically the child of one of his employees, Tiny Tim, mattered a lot. When the ghost of Christmas future takes Scrooge into the future, what he's trying to make clear to Scrooge is that his legacy, whether he likes it or not, involves children. Tiny Tim becomes a metaphor for a world in which children are not only disabled, Tiny Tim is disabled, but a world in which children are impoverished. I think part of what Dickens is trying to say is that the future of any society is highly dependent upon children, even if we don't have kids, as Scrooge didn't. Scrooge realized that. Scrooge had to change his mission to recognize the importance of children for building a viable community and a viable future. And so I think one of the tragedies of this case, maybe the biggest tragedy of this case, is the fact that children were murdered for no reason. And that in some ways, when we have a mission that neglects or overlooks the importance of children, whether we have them or not, is when we neglect or overlook the importance of children, in some ways, we're overlooking not only our legacy, but the ability of our community to survive into the future. I think that's what Dickens knowingly or unknowingly is really getting at. Again, the tragedy of this case is that their mission had no concern for the kids. In fact, was willing to go so far as to kill them, to murder them, to prove that the New Jerusalem took precedence over everything else. The question, the obvious question I would have for anyone who's trying to develop a mission or an important mission would be, does it in some ways incorporate something pro-social about the future? Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, children are a part of that future. Whatever else happens, to society, there can't be a future without acknowledging the importance of the children in our society. In fact, I would say, if we don't protect our kids, what's left? What else do we have? If I had a chance to revisit this issue with my life coach friend, I think I might ask him, what if Chad and Lori Daybell walked into your office with their mission? How would you handle that? 
Would you see that as a positive scenario? Would you try to change their mission? And why would you do that? After all, it's their mission. It's the thing they're most passionate about, right? How would you handle that? Is it ever okay to have a mission where killing children is acceptable? Is it ever permissible to have a mission where killing thousands of people, if you're a terrorist, is acceptable? As a life coach, is it your job to promote that mission or is it your job to change it? Well, I would hope it would be to change it. But do well, you change it to another mission? Right. And then whose mission is it? I mean, wh what would you do? Well, first of all, I wouldn't be as wrapped up in promoting a mission. And this is why. <laughs> Right. I might endorse having a mission to some degree if that's what the person is invested in. But I think I might challenge it to see if it's consistent with what they really value. I think the real trick here is getting people to reflect deeply on who they are and what they really value and whether the mission's consistent with that. So I think in the end, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow lost sight of that. They lost sight of who they really were. And that's something I'm going to be talking a lot with Lori. My aspiration, if you're going to have a mission... Stay flexible, stay resilient. Resiliency is the key. Have the ability to go with the flow. Know who you are, know what's your value, and base it on that. Don't lose sight of it, and I think you'll find your way. When we started our podcast, we had a mission to stay consistent, to not miss a week. But after moving, we realized we had to be flexible. So thank you to those who have stuck with us, even though we missed a week. We're going to keep going. We're so grateful for the fans that reach out to us like Felicia. Let us know what you are liking, what you want more of, which we know is Lori Vallow. She's coming. In the meantime, go like our Facebook page, Hidden, a true crime podcast, our Instagram page, at Hidden True Crime. Our website is coming. We're being flexible on that too, as it's taken a lot longer than we thought. And if you want to hear the entire 20-minute phone call between Lori, Melanie, and Chad, we will have a link to that on our Facebook page. Again, it's Hidden a True Crime podcast or at Hidden True Crime. Go check that out. In addition to those that need a bit more backstory or want to keep the timeline very clear because you have a mind like mine and, and you're a journalist and you just need all the details, Tylee's aunt has put together an incredible timeline. I'm going to have a link to that timeline that you can see also on our Facebook page. So go check out both the link to the entire 20 minute phone call as well as this in-depth detailed timeline of everything that has happened with this case. Thank you to those that are sharing with your friends that we have a seat for them as well at our dinner table. Dinner's wrapping up, we're finishing dessert. I wanna reiterate the importance of staying safe and wearing a helmet and trying to stay out of portals if you can. If you do find yourself in a portal, stay flexible. We can get out of there. It's never too late to find your way out. If you do find yourself in a portal, try as hard as you can not to have that portal transport you to Chad Daybell's utopian world. Just get out. Stop, drop, and roll. From the portal. From the portal. It is not too late to redirect your mission and get out. Stay we'll flexible. Even, we'll even provide you, upon request, with our three-year-old's helmet. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week and good night. Good night. Good night.